fights if you have. Yep. Okay, so it's all on screen? Yes, it yep, is indeed. It's okay, great. Um, so I'm Sarah Chadwick. Uh, I'm supervised by Rob Davies in the Department of Psychology and uh, Debbie Costain in the Department of Statistics. Um, in this short talk, um, I'm going to talk about two of my studies that I've completed as part of my thesis so far, uh, which examine the accuracy of meta-comprehension judgments on health-related texts. So before this, I'll briefly discuss um, the topic of meta-comprehension and an overview of some of the published uh, research as just a general uh, view. So, okay. So, um, meta-comprehension refers to thoughts about one's own comprehension. Uh, so for example, the question, how well do you understand this information? That question can be understood as a method of eliciting a meta-comprehension judgment, given that the responder has to consider the status of their internal comprehension in order to provide an answer. So that's where that metacognitive aspect comes from. These kinds of questions are quite common in dialogue uh, between health professionals and patients, and also in daily life, you might say after giving someone an instruction, did, did you understand that? Um, but they're also used in the production of written health information. Oh. Sorry, okay. Um, so the NHS makes use of reader panels uh, to review patient information and these are groups of people who volunteer their time, they self-select, um, to read and evaluate revised patient information documents. As part of that evaluation process, uh, individuals on reader panels provide metacomprehension judgments. So they'll respond sometimes binary, sometimes as a rating of how well that information is understood and how sensible it is. Um, but they also measure other things, so is, is the language appropriate? Um, is there enough pictures or that kind of thing? Are the pictures appropriate? My research focuses on, on that sort of context where these judgments are, occur and are used um, in response to written health information. So to illustrate what we mean about metacomprehension accuracy, uh, this is a simplification uh, where green is kind of where we want people to be in terms of their metacomprehension. So when individuals have high levels of comprehension, uh, we want them to be aware of that. We want them to know when they're getting things right. And when their understanding is low, we want them to know that they don't understand. So concerningly, previously, concerningly previous research suggests that overall we're not actually very good at discerning um, between high and low states of comprehension. So numerous reviews have estimated the average correlation between perceived and assessed comprehension to be around 0.2. There's a recent one that just came out last year that's replicating the same things so around 0.2. Um, in addition, there seems to be quite a lot of variability between people um, in that coefficient, with some people being able to show near perfect accuracy, um, while others show a negative association. And for those individuals showing that negative association, when they report the highest levels of understanding, they're actually in reality experiencing the lowest levels of comprehension. So that's really concerning when we think about these judgments um, as forming part of an evaluation process of health information. We want these judgments to be valid and reliable to actually be a useful tool to create comprehensible health information. So that conclusion might be a little bit premature. Um, so previous research has a number of methodological and analytic limitations. So for example, whether the questions themselves are testing understanding or something else um, like background knowledge or uh, just memory for the text, or whether the samples um, are just only made of students and only texts that are from sort of college level textbooks, so really specific groups of people. In terms of analysis, ratings are generally treated as interval data and the multi-level structure of the design isn't really incorporated very effectively into the analysis. So a two-step approach is, is often applied in some of these studies where um, a, co a correlation coefficient is calculated for an individual and then that's used as a dependent variable um, in a, a second step regression. Um, just, a, just a linear regression of those, where the uncertainty in those correlation coefficients is basically discarded at the point that they use as the outcome variable. And that's pretty worrying because there's probably a lot of uh, uncertainty attached to those because there's very few observations per person to estimate that coefficient. So altogether, that means that it's not unlikely that there's uh, pretty poor quality estimates of metacomprehension in the literature. Um, and those estimates might not generalise particularly well to different populations of people or texts. So to address these issues um, and to consider whether using judgments of comprehension is a useful tool to produce health information, my uh, first study addressed the question, are judgments of comprehension predictive understanding of health information? So pretty straightforward, kind of like a, a replication, but to see where we are in terms of understanding. So uh, a pretty simple design, we used uh, 175 UK adults uh, recruited through Prolific. 
Um, they read 10 health related texts which were adapted from um, online NHS information, which was like an A to Z of health conditions. Um, they were presented with each text on screen. Uh, they then judged their understanding of each text on a five point scale. Uh, and then after reading everything and judging everything, they then completed some comprehension questions, which were um, four questions per text and a multiple choice framework. In terms of analysis, uh, a Bayesian multi-level logistic model was used to analyze the association between perceived and assessed comprehension. We also looked at some individual difference variables, uh, but I've omitted talking about these here because we didn't really find anything. Um, but if you want to know more about that, then just ask. OK, so in terms of findings, um, similar to previous research, we did see a weak positive association between rated perceived comprehension and the probability of answering a comprehension question correctly. So there is kind of that link that we do see an overall weak positive association. However, in terms of individual variability, that was pretty limited. So there was no negative associations between perceived and assessed comprehensions, uh, perceived and assessed comprehension, sorry. Um, and in terms of the, the, the scope of um, individual variance, it wasn't, it wasn't massive, it was quite a small amount of variance. So while the lack of a strong association between uh, perceived and assessed comprehension is a little bit disappointing, uh, at least we're not seeing people who are really far off the mark in terms of monitoring the comprehension after reading, which is, is positive overall. So the next question that followed on from this was to consider what these judgments are able to tell us about individuals and their understanding of the text. So that is, are they based on particular aspects of text understanding or is it just a generic sort of judgment overall? Um, if it was particular aspects that they were based on, this could explain why we see a weak association if we're not measuring the things that those judgments are based on, because we're introducing measurement error there. So, uh, based on research indicating that semantically central elements of a text um, form the gist or the macro structure of a text, and this could be what individuals are judging when they make these decisions about their understanding, my second study addressed the question, are judgments of comprehension more predictive of understanding key information than information that's sort of peripheral or auxiliary to those, those key points in the text. In terms of design, really similar. Um, we recruited uh, 225 UK adults again using Prolific. Um, this time they read 13 texts and they were from a, a wider range of sources um, to sort of bring in a bit more generalizability. Uh, but again, on the topic of health conditions. Uh, after reading each text, they judged the comprehension on seven point scales to see if this effect was robust uh, changes in the scale. Um, and the comprehension was assessed after reading all texts and judging all texts on a six point, sorry, six multiple choice questions uh, where half of them were sort of central key elements in the text and the other half were sort of the peripheral auxiliary details in the text. Again, uh, a Bayesian multi-level model was used here to analyse uh, the association between perceived and assessed comprehension. And again, we did look at some individual different measures as well, but we didn't see anything going on with those. So again, I've not talked about them here, but if you want to know, just ask. OK, so uh, in terms of findings, we didn't quite see what we expected to see. So uh, judgments of comprehension were pretty much comparably predictive of understanding both the key ideas in text and also those which were more peripheral. Um, in terms of individual variability, we did see a handful of model estimate slopes which were, were negative, um, suggesting that some people were reporting higher levels of comprehension, even when they were actually experiencing lower levels of comprehension over, over different texts. So uh, those negative slopes were sensitive to model specification though. Um, so if we fit a model that sort of uh, constrained the intercept to account for guessing in multiple choice responses, then the occurrence of negative estimates uh, did change. So uh, they disappeared in the peripheral uh, elements and I think it went down to about two people for the central ones. Um, but what this does suggest though is that that negative association may well occur uh, with some plausibility, uh, but fortunately for the vast majority of individuals, it appears to be the case that it's generally a positive association between perceived and assessed comprehension. So uh, based on the studies completed, uh, we can make the following sort of interim conclusions at this point. So um, there is, but well, there appears to be evidence in the sample of texts and people and questions, uh, a weak positive association between perceived and assessed comprehension. Um, and these judgments of understanding are informative of both central key information and peripheral auxiliary details in the text. There's pretty limited evidence that we've seen for sorry, um, for um, variability between individuals. Uh, the vast majority of individuals uh, do show this sort of weakly positive effect um, and there's, there's not a lot of variation in that. Um, overall, these findings indicate that people are telling you something honest about the state of their understanding. These judgments aren't just nonsense, they're not random um, and judgments 
are informative in a sense of a sort of a, a broad spread of elements in the text, given that they, they're predictive of both central and peripheral details. So this means that, um, I guess at this point you could say overall, that uh, judgments of comprehension are somewhat valid um, in helping to evaluate written health information. So uh, that is if people, if a person tells you that the information isn't very well understood relative to another document, which they say this one is much better understood, then you can have some confidence that that person is telling you something and that that judgment is linked to actual understanding of various elements in the text. However, what it does show is that collecting uh, ratings of comprehension is evidently not a comparable substitute for assessing understanding of comprehension. Um, and I think in the context of health information, it's always really important to make sure that what you want people to understand is well understood and you've, you've guaranteed that um, in the document that you're producing as much as you can, obviously. Um, so the next step in terms of uh, research will be to examine some possible reasons why the predictive relationship um, isn't higher and how it could be improved. Um, specifically sort of looking at whether uh, elements in the text could be used as the prompt rather than to do like a, an overall more global judgment of the text to sort of improve it. So can we can we look for those specific ideas and ask people do they understand specific ideas and does accuracy improve? So thank you very much uh, for your attention. I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you, Sarah. That's a really, really interesting topic. So thank you for bringing that up um, for us. We have a few questions here. Um, Marguerite's got one that was very similar to what I was going to ask. Who were your participants? Were they mostly university educated or did they represent like a wider group of individuals? Uh, hard to say in terms of education because it wasn't a variable that we looked at, although I think that information might be available in prolific, so I'd have to go back and check. Um, but in terms of um, eligibility for taking part in the, the study in prolific, there was no um, upper or lower thresholds to do that. So anyone was allowed to participate, whoever was on there. I think in general prolific's um, population tends to be a little bit more educated and um, tends to be sort of young, middle-aged and female. Um, so I think that's something to bear in mind that these results don't necessarily reflect the whole population. There's definitely people on there who aren't captured. Um, so people with particularly low levels of, of reading comprehension and that kind of thing. Brilliant. So relating to that, do you think the um, like the almost surprising lack of individual differences may be due to the similarity of the participants? Yeah, potentially. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I think that that's a concern for sure, because um, you, you, your conclusions are always limited by um, the features of your data that you're collecting or I guess the inability to sample really randomly from the population. Um, but in some ways, I think it's it also is an important lesson as well, because um, these individuals on reader panels self select to do that. Um, they're just volunteer positions and the people who are sort of motivated to do that aren't necessarily the kind of people that would benefit the most from having these documents reviewed by someone like them. Um, so I think people in those reader panels probably do have a tendency to be better educated and, and have more motivation to engage with health information. Um, so I think maybe another look at people who are sort of lower end in reading skills would be really valuable to see what's going on there. Brilliant, yeah, definitely, thank you. Um, so we've got another question here. Um, I'm wondering whether there might be differences if you looked at people reading health information about conditions they have been diagnosed with, possibly in terms of uh, overwhelm at the point of recent diagnosis or later effects of motivation to understand their health. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I think that's a huge, a huge issue. Um, so this is almost like research in a vacuum. Um, so this is people who, who read the text who don't have any um, personal connection, presumably most of the time to the diseases. We did include a measure of sort of familiarity and we did see almost like floor line familiarity, which is what we were aiming for because we didn't want people to have that background knowledge coming to the table with it. We wanted them to be like reader, reader panel members who were just sort of reviewing the text for the text sake. Um, yeah. But I think it's, yeah, it's massively important to think about actually that, that a patient comes with a lot of baggage. Um, and I know um, from experience of, of friends and family that when you receive like a diagnosis or you receive some bad news in a health context, then information processing mm -hmm. isn't very effective. Um, and I think that's a whole other um, thing to think about in yeah. terms of how these documents can be effective and if they even are effective in that context. Yeah, definitely. That's such an interesting point. And we've got one very interesting point from um, Daniel Lackens now. Um, I wonder if there's been research on this in the context of ethical consent. 
is asking if our participants have understood what they are consenting to sufficient or should we more actively quiz them, especially for certain populations, maybe some more clinical populations, perhaps. Um, what, what do you think with regards to your results um, and implications um, for ethical consent? Mm, yeah, I think uh, informed consent is one thing. I think, I think it gets thrown around quite easily in terms of what people are actually, the, the, the degree to which they're understanding what it is that they're consenting to in terms of like medical procedures. Um, I guess it's that whole other sort of like issue of stake and interest and power um, in a sort of patient doctor situation um, where people tend to think, well, you know best, I won't bother um, making these decisions. Um, or sometimes it's just irrational. So people will just make some decisions based on what they want to do, regardless of the risk and regardless if they really understand what it is that they're consenting to. Um, yeah, I think it's really important because it's the foundation of any good sort of health service is that consent should be informed. Um, and I think it sort of shines a light on just asking people if they understand the information maybe isn't sufficient uh, because we don't see that, you know, like for like com com relationship between um, comprehension that's assessed and comprehension that's perceived. So, yeah, it's, it's difficult, but I think it's an issue for sure. Definitely. I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> No, de definitely. I really do think it's an interesting point to consider. Thank you so much, Sarah. It was a really, really interesting talk. If anyone has any more questions, um, I'm sure Sarah will be happy to take them at a later date. But thank you so much, Sarah. Um, yeah, thanks pass for that. Back to Matthias. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Sarah. So we're just going to take a break until 12, uh, where we have Matthew, who will be speaking to us. So again, just pop to the bathroom or grab a coffee and then we will be back very soon.